Hey there, Hell Yes Lifers. It's uh, time for another episode of the Hell Yes Life podcast. I am your host, Norman Bell, and I'm super excited. Uh, uh, today I have as my guest, Vincent Jenna. Let me tell you a little bit about Vincent. Vincent is a triple power psychic, an authentic and gifted psychic with the knowledge and experience of a licensed psychotherapist and the big charming personality of a showman, which you're going about to hear and get a little taste of that. Um, he combines his early background as a professional actor and singer, a master's in clinical social work, and his hospice experience helping more than 500 patients through the dying process with his uncanny skills as a metaphysician and psychic medium. The sum total of these experiences and gifts is a psychic who can guide people not only to recognize what is preventing them from healing or attaining their dreams, but the necessary steps to get there. Vincent, welcome to the Hell Yes Life podcast. Well, Norman, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm so excited to be here. Oh, I think you, I think you sounded, it, when I first heard of, about you and what you do, I just thought to myself, this sounds like a, a perfect guest for the Hell Yes Life podcast. And for, for those of you who are listening on the, uh, the audio version of the podcast, uh, one thing you're missing out on is the um, great backdrop that Vincent has. Uh, it looks like he's, he's decked out for the holidays. Where this this episode um, will probably uh, air in the new year, in January of the new year, but we're just uh, in full transparency. We're recording it uh, in, in December in the holiday time. Well, Vincent, um, uh, th welcome to the, the podcast. And I always like to um, start off by asking my guests, what is your hell yes? And by that, I mean, what is that thing that really lights you up and makes you come alive? Oh, wow. Okay, what really makes me come alive is to be able to speak in front of 80,000 people, a million people, I don't care, in order to deliver the message of trying to help people believe in themselves that you are magnificent, that you can create all you want. And so it, it is such an incredible, empowering feeling for me to be able to do that in front of as many people as I can. So mm -hmm. all over the world, and it, that's all I care about, hell yes. Hell yes. That sounds like a hell yes. Uh, that sounds like a hell yes, hell yes. Uh, a, a, great, yeah. a great passion to be able to deliver that message. And you've done a lot of that, I can see, uh, over, the, uh, over the years. You've uh, had many uh, TV appearances on uh, various networks and so on. Um, when did you first realize that this was your hell yes? And no pressure if you can't remember the, the precise moment in the playground when you were six years old, but anything come to mind? Actually, it wasn't when I was six years old. It was exactly when I was 28 years old. Um, I did not have that type of, um, shall we say, beginning early experience with all of this, like some of the kids did, you know, uh, when I was five years old, walking in and seeing an angel on their bed. Wow, fantastic. No, usually when I walked in my bedroom, it was either my mother and father with the bell ready to beat me for something stupid, I don't know. Um, uh, but it was at 28 years old when I had this very unselfish uh, plea uh, to be able to learn how to help people. I had a friend uh, who was my original torment. I mean, so many people have heard this story over and over again, but it's such a profound story. I mean, he was the one that incited a lot of the bullying that happened to me and all the way until I was 17 years old, right? Mm. And so after our 10-year high school reunion, it reversed itself and he became now a very close friend of mine. Hmm. Uh, very endearing, uh, and there was no need for, you know, forgiveness or apologies or anything like that. It was just the way he embraced me and the way I embraced him, it was as if we were always friends. And his life was just in shambles, and he was the guy that never shared that, you know, that man that packs away all of those feelings, doesn't let you know anything is wrong. And there was a little narcissism there, helping him get through by bragging about how great his job was, and his wife, as his childhood sweetheart with three kids and his beautiful condo in Connecticut in a very rich area and, you know, perfect health and all of that. And I felt that that was all BS, you know, <laughs> I, and I don't know why I felt that. I just felt that in my heart. So it was after spending a weekend with him, my wife and I are traveling home. I'm hysterical in tears. I am in tears crying out to God 
please give me the ability to help this guy. Back then, all I cared about being was an actor. I was a professional singer, actor, and dancer. Um, I had no means of counseling or anything like that, no concept of it at all. And within a couple of weeks of begging for that to happen, give me the ability to help people because I knew what it was like to have your heart and your self-esteem just broken and torn away by the torment I went through, right? And, and everybody goes through different torment. So I, that's what I asked for. And, and in hindsight, I look at it and go, you know what was so weird about that is I didn't pray for him. Now, normally when people are in trouble, right, Norman, you, you, you pray for that person if you, you believe in that. And even if you don't believe in it, you send out something positive, please take care of him, please help him, something like that. I didn't. I turned around and I said, help me help him. Hmm. And that's when it began to happen. And I'm talking, it was a floodgate of metaphysics, paranormal, spirituality, all at once, Cecil B. DeMille, Steven Spielberg, um, Paul the guys, um, uh, the Ten Commandments, I mean, whatever you want to call one of those old epic movies back then that was seen so spiritual and religious and stuff like that, that's the stuff that was happening to me. And, and slowly but surely, all this ability happened. But I, I didn't take it on so willingly and so easily, that's for sure. That was a hell no. Okay. Okay. You know, the, um, what re that reminds me of, I, I've done some work around kind of like storytelling, coaching, and workshops and so forth. And so I know the, the phases of the hero's journey. And it sounds like you had the, um, the call to adventure and then there's sort of a, there's a, often a, a period where people kind of say no to that adventure. Like Luke Skywalker said, no, I don't think I'm going to go on this adventure, Obi-Wan Kenobi. But then he's sort of forced into it. So take, take us there. So what, then what happens? So you sort of- Wow, well, you just, you just, uh, you know what? I have been doing this work for 37 years and you just gave me an aha moment. You likened me to some of those people that I so much admire and, and you put me in that category that I was resistant because I was afraid. I was like, yeah, yeah, I, I was. I, um, why me? You know, why? Mm -hmm. What was so special about me? I wasn't that special of a guy at all. I mean, I was a good kid. I didn't have any problems. But I mean, I was the altar boy in the back of the church that was eating the host and, you know, sipping on the wine back there, <laughs> you know. And now all of a sudden, I'm supposed to be the spiritual teacher. And um, I I just, it, it, slowly but surely, ability started to come to me. So the first thing that came to me is my psychic ability and wisdom. I was downloading and I started trancing um, this spirit. And the spirit introduced himself through a friend first, then through me as Joseph, Joseph from Canaan. Joseph and the amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat Joseph. And I had no idea about him yet. Um, I didn't even know the musical. And I think that it was just before that musical came out, really, and it became really popular, or just about the same time. But I, even though I was into musical theater, I, I, I didn't go to Broadway a lot at all. So I didn't know any of this story. And yet he was introduced to me as my major guide. And then eventually I felt compelled to speak for him, which was channeling and trancing. I didn't realize I was doing that. And my wife and I, well, well, God bless my wife. Um, she was with me since I was 17 years old. We've been together for 47 years now. And so she knew that I had no idea about what all of a sudden was coming out of my mouth, these words, these profound words of wisdom about the meaning of life, about why we're here, what we're supposed to do, our passions, our purpose, our souls, God, Jesus, everybody. And, and, and then we would go and sneak in the libraries, right, in the bookstores, because all that information was in the cult section. Mm. You know, and you don't want your neighbors seeing that you were in the weirdo section, you know, and we're picking the books off the shelf and perusing them from anybody. And there were passages in there that I had spoken. And that was the only thing that led her to believe that I wasn't insane. 
and and but but there was still this fear and this resistance and a, a pushback. I still I wanted to be a professional singer, actor, and dancer. Okay, so maybe I could develop some abilities and stuff like that. But I don't know how to be a spiritual teacher. That's what was being presented to me, and so I didn't want to leave the idea that I was meant to be a you know a star. Like, you know, on Broadway, in the movies, you know, get an Academy Award, an Emmy, a Tony, anything. And and so it, it started off really slow and we just kept gaining the information. And actually, I began to share it with a very close friend of mine. He was very interested in what I was learning because he felt something was going on. And if it wasn't for him and his wife accepting that, I think my wife and I would have resisted more and stopped the information from coming, but he validated me, you know? So it, it began slowly and, and, and then, and here's the thing, psychic. That's what was coming to me. I'm a psychic. I don't want to be a psychic. Crazy people in California were psychics, okay? <laughs> that was my impression back then. You know, I'm, I was a kid from Levittown, Long Island, a small little community, mm -hmm. you know, suburban track home community, very lower middle class area. So I didn't have any of the insight and the knowledge of all these metaphysical things, nor the spiritual things. It was just Roman Catholic. My wife was Jewish. Neither one of us really followed out the tenets of our religions because we believed that we had more commonality than differences. And so it took me a very long time to accept, but slowly but surely, when I started affecting people, I started to learn how to do tarot card readings. I did that on a quiet, you know, tarot card readings, and I would work. And then eventually I was doing these readings without the cards and all these people were coming to me part-time. I did it part-time. I was actually in a traveling psychic show. We <laughs> went on Garden State Parkway every Sunday of the month. We were from the north all the way to the south in a different location. And all these people kept following me and looking forward to me coming. And the <laughs> other psychics, there were like 10 of us. And I was the only one completely sold out for the entire day that I was there. And dribs and drabs went to the other ones. I didn't understand, but I was starting to love the effect I had on people. And that's what began to lead me to accept more. But I still didn't know how to make a career out of this. Then in the future, things changed about that. Mm -hmm. So there, did that answer that question? I mean, that was a, a long kind of answer. I kind of forgot whether I answered it or not. That's no, perfect. I... No, that's, that is um, <laughs> often what happens. People go, yeah, as a matter of fact, I do remember when I first did this happened and, and, uh, and you told me. Right, to yeah. So, and we'll get into the, the, next, uh, the next part of your story in just a second. Um, but uh, thank you so much for sharing that, Vincent, that, that uh, you're kind of your origin story, really. And, um, and yeah, I identify with that. And I, I, I maybe just want to take a, a moment to acknowledge that um, there, I don't know who's out there listening right now, but for some people, this might be right in line. It's like, yeah, I, I have a, a regular psychic I go to all the time. And I, or I know Vincent and um, I know his work. I really admire it. And there might be other people out there where the, this is a bit of a stretch for them to, you know, believe that this is, um, you know, the, the case, what you've just, uh, just kind of unpacked there. And it sounds like I'll bet I'll bet you might have some thoughts about that because it's it sounds like this sort of was was that right that before this occurrence this had really not been a part of your life is that true not at all a part of my life yeah. I was totally it, it wasn't that I was a skeptic about it I never gave it any thought yeah you know other than my only truly my only experience was um, in California. You know, a friend of mine used to, you know, want to take me to a psychic fair every so often. And I don't know, you know, there was those so such stereotypic psychics there with the beads and the bandanas and, and all the flowing robes. And that was the guys. And uh, the, 
right? <laughs> Forget the girls and all the, you know, all of the paraphernalia and the burning of the sage and all of the aromatherapies floating around. And I, I you know, again, I came from a really small community, really small background. Yes, I was an actor. I was living in California at the time. But I still was very shielded from that kind of stuff. And um, I didn't judge it harshly. I just didn't pay any attention to it at all. Yeah. So when it began to happen to me, it was the oddest thing of all that, okay, how do you hit? And here's where a lot of the skepticism comes in for people. We're all intuitive, first of all, all right? There is no doubt to that. A matter of fact, we would not be alive today if it wasn't for intuition. Intuition mm -hmm. is what keeps us alive. It is the life force of the spiritual body. It's the life force, it, like blood is the life force of the physical body, but it guides us everywhere. So that's mm -hmm. what, I, you take the word psychic and substitute the word intuition for mm -hmm. it because that's what it's all about, all right? Okay. I tap into our intuition, all right? But, you know what? I just forgot where I was originally going with that, but it was about the psychic stuff. And, and it, it, it was interesting to me that um, as it began to happen to me, I was like wondering, okay, how do you become a spiritual teacher? That's where I was going. How do you become a spiritual teacher and the psychic at the same time. I mean, it, does that stuff go against each other? That's what a lot of people believe. They have wrong ideas about be it Christianity and being a psychic or a medium. Mm -hmm. They think it's evil. They think it's, it's Jesus said, no, you know, don't go to any psychic or medium. He did not say that. You've got to remember the times back then, all right? We're talking about you know, way back in Roman times where there were tons of superstitions and, and all these different beliefs. And there was all these different practices as well. There weren't real doctors back then, right? There were um, the, these people that did herbology, that tried to practice new, you know, um, natural type of medicine, you know, cutting you and bleeding you and all of that nonsensical stuff and herbs and stuff like that. But then they were also witches, practicing witches, pra practicing the negative part, putting curses on people. So if you had an enemy, people used to go and seek out what's called a necromancer back then and, and ask them to put an evil spell on somebody or to cast a love spell on somebody that they wanted to fall in love. Well, that's what was in existence. Besides, the prophets were totally the guides of the land and totally religious. The, the prophets actually were in the temples, the Jewish temples. That's where their home was. It wasn't until King David that he decided that he wanted as much power as the prophet. So he put the prophet and the king together in the, in the castle and the temple. So he made the temple the castle. But they always turned to prophets, right? Jesus said in the New Testament, if we want to say anything, don't seek out a necromancer because they are in conjunction with the devil, which, which was his way of saying that's negative stuff and evil stuff. Just stay away from it. OK, mm -hmm. it had nothing to do with don't seek out a psychic or a medium. But yet that's what people are afraid of. Mm -hmm. I have more Christian people turning around and telling me that that I'm bad, I'm evil, that I'm not helping people more than I have skeptics that don't believe in me. Yeah. Yeah. OK. So that sounds like that's uh, that a lot of experience with that. I'm just wondering oh, yeah. for actually I would I would put myself in the kind of agnostic or op I'm open and, and curious, like, who am I to know exactly what's going on out there? And so I, I love talking to uh, different people like yourself who have, you know, vastly different experiences and, um, and learning from that. So what would you what would you say to somebody like me or maybe even someone who's a little bit more skeptical? Maybe they're not in this kind of Christian camp. Uh, where they, they have a problem with that, but just like, well, I don't know, really? Did that really happen? Like, um, do, you, do you have conversations with people like that? Or do you just kind of let go of like, well, you know, you're, you're entitled to your beliefs and 
Um, and oh, I will never, you will not find me on the streets of Manhattan standing there and saying that the world is coming to an end <laughs> unless you repent. You will not see me doing that, okay? Um, if I'm standing on the streets of Manhattan, I'm eating a pretzel or roasted chestnuts, okay? <laughs> um, but here, here is the thing about that. It's not until somebody opens the door for me, yeah. if they ask me a question, if they come to me for a reading, and I've had many of them, which I find very interesting, they preface their, their session by saying, just so that you know, I'm a skeptic, I don't believe in this stuff. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, <laughs> well, thank you for paying me for something you don't believe in. Um, why did you show up then? I know, and here's the thing, there is no such thing as a cynic or a skeptic in my book. Mm. A cynic or a skeptic is someone who doesn't believe the words that have been describing, whether it be God, spirit, source, they don't believe those words. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They don't believe the descriptions. Yes, they say, well, I don't believe in God. No, you don't believe in the definition that you've heard of God. But here is the thing. You have this hell yes show. What do you think you're doing it for? You're doing it just for your self-pleasure? You're doing it because you're trying to get messages out there to people. That means you're a good person. Mm -hmm. If you're a good person, you are absolutely in alignment with the same thing I'm in alignment with. Yeah. So it doesn't matter whether you call it the same name that I can. Maybe one day we'll get a better definition. I try to give better definitions so people can relate to it and go, well, you know what? That I can believe in. And Absolutely. let me tell you something. Yes, about my practice. I am the only psychic medium that has a 50% male and 50% female um, clientele. Mm. That is unheard of in my field because most men, they're more skeptics than the women are because they're very yeah. left brain, very logical. They're going to be thinking more than they're going to be into their intuition and feeling. Mm -hmm. But they love what I say. I resonate with them. I actually bring them out of their left brain and they go into their right brain, even if it's for a moment to feel what I'm saying, and then they can relate to me. So that to me tells me it's been the words and think about the preachings think about what we've been taught think about where religion goes it does nothing today except still condemn rather than teach acceptance teach love i don't believe in that but it's more about the messengers than it is the message. So we can't get rid of what could be true just because we don't like the sound of how it's been defined. I love that. I, I, I liked what you, what it resonated when you were talking about intuition. Um, and, and I like, that was interesting that you said that intuition is like the spiritual lifeblood, the way that, you know, blood is for our body. And that kind of resonated with like, well, I know I have intuition. I consider myself a fairly right, right brain, creative male, I guess. Uh, and, uh, so I could, I could, I could see that that's not a bridge too far for me to go. So hell yes, lifers out there listening, you know, hopefully you're, um, you know, open your opening your mind a bit to what Vincent is uh, talking about here. Vincent, I wanted you to take us forward a little bit from where you left off in your story to now. I mean, the, part of what this show is about is how, you know, people are out there, people like you are out there having, uh, you know, a hell yes life. They're a hell yes entrepreneur in a way. Mm -hmm. They're, um, you know, creating a business out of their passion and purpose and, uh, and their story. And, uh, and you are certainly a great example of that. So how did you go forward from here to uh, make this, make a living out of this? Wow. Yeah, that's a good question because um, there was so much resistance well, here's what I wound up doing um, because, again, I had such a hard time just dealing with being a psychic uh, for that reason. Everything you just defined, I did not want to get into a practice where people were going to have a hard time believing me. Yeah. 
you know? And because of that stupid word, psychic, mm. you know, okay, so what I used to do is when I was doing my readings, um, I my business cards, I kept changing my title. I was an intuitive, an intuitive messenger, a transformational coach. <laughs> um, I came up with everything that I can say except psychic. Yeah. And then a, a situation had occurred in my life that took me out of my full-time job. I was injured in an automobile accident. And at the time, I, you know, it, I, when you're an actor, you constantly have to have a bread and butter job. Well, at some point when my daughter was born, it was my second child, I realized that it was time for me to move beyond the acting field and get something a little bit more substantial. But I stayed in the entertainment field and I became, I wound up becoming, again, the way things happen for a reason. Um, I wound up getting a job at the same time. I had an audition on Broadway for the replacement part of Marius in Les Miserables. Okay. Mm -hmm. That leading role. Okay. And it was, I was going to be considered for the role and I was waiting for the callback. Okay. At the same time, I had told my wife, I'm also going to seek out a full-time job and see, you know, if I don't get on Broadway, I can get the full-time job and then that's it with, with acting, I'll go full-time. And, but I wanted something, oh my God, I had so many bread and butter jobs in my life. Nothing was a good taste in my mouth except performing. You know, when you have a passion and you're doing something other than your passion, everything else is tasteless and, oh, and, oh, and yeah. it's horrible, right? Yeah. And unfulfilling. Yep. So I had asked guidance, just universal guidance again. Um, I said, listen, okay, I need something. So, but it has to be something that I'm going to enjoy. And, I, and back then, I'm giving away my age but we looked in newspapers at the want ads. <laughs> you know, that was ancient times, you know, mm -hmm. um, before there was the internet. Yeah. So I'm looking in the paper and the paper is stuck together. And as I'm turning the page, all of a sudden I noticed this ad trainer for an entertainment company. A trainer for an entertainment company? What type of entertainment? Wow, that was really cool. And it turned out to be a mobile dish jockey company that went around and did parties, but it was a very popular, famous one um, in the New Jersey area. And they were looking for an assistant manager in the office, which meant good pay at least, but also a trainer teach them how to perform and how to do a party. And I was like, wow, that's exciting. I'd like that. I was a DJ at, as a part-time job once when I was an actor at a country western nightclub. That was another thing. And also at Wurlitzer's, which was an old 50s, 60s nightclub, giving away my age like crazy. Um, so I, I went for the interview. Now the job hadn't been created yet. So they were interviewing anyway, waiting to get the approval from the corporate headquarters. At the same time, I auditioned for the Broadway replacement part. Okay, I left it to Providence. And I said, you bring me to where I'm supposed to go. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So Friday morning at 11 a.m., I get a phone call from the casting agent at doing Les Miserables saying, we are not going to call you in to, for the replacement part um, because we decided that we're going to go younger again. I was a little bit older. And... At 11.05, I get a phone call from this entertainment company saying they got the approval to create the job. The job is mine. Wow. Yeah. So that's where I first started doing motivating. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And I started training people. Okay. So jump, jumping ahead, I wound up moving on and creating my own entertainment company. And I was doing that for a while, was in the car accident, though I was totally unfulfilled. I was, yes, I enjoyed doing the work, but I gave up being an actor. I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm lugging around crates of LPs because we did nothing with digital and nothing was on CDs yet. So I was in a car accident. I couldn't do that anymore. I was like, okay, now what do I do? And I was also doing part-time readings. 
And so many of my clients, I, you know, I'd shared my story with them. I, you know, got to figure out what I'm going to be doing. They said, why don't you go back to school and become a therapist? I said, become a therapist? What are you kidding? I, I didn't have any schooling at all. No college at all. I dropped out. When you're an actor, even though I received a full scholarship to Hofstra University, one of the best universities in New York, I dropped out of it because I didn't think I needed to go to college and get a degree in order to be an actor in California. You know, we make these dumb choices sometimes, okay? So they wanted me to go back to school, get a psychotherapy degree, which meant not just an undergrad degree for four years, but possibly an additional four years after that. I was 39 years old. Mm. So I'm looking at that eight years. Okay, so, all right, 47 doesn't seem so bad, but oh my God, my, we have two kids. Um, how do I do this? I brought it up with my wife that because my client said I get better therapy from you as a psychic medium than I get from my own therapist. And she said, why don't you go back to school? I'll support us. You go full time. I'm like, you're kidding me. So I figured, you know what, what that would do also, that would give me other credibility. It would give me the capacity to be able to, if I'm going to be this psychic medium, I can actually do it from a psychotherapy mental perspective, which is very credible that people could understand. And so that's what led me to college. I actually went for seven years. Um, I, had to, I took a little bit longer, but I did not go for a full four year after degree because I didn't need it. That's why I went and got my social work degree as a clinical social worker, because a clinical social worker can do the exact same work as a psychologist can, except the clinical social worker can't do chest uh, testing, like personality testing or ADD testing of children. And I didn't care about that anyway. I just wanted to do therapy. So that's what I did. Now, the funny thing is, is as I was going for my degree and I was doing my internship, all my supervisors kept telling me was, Vince, you have got a sixth sense when it comes to psychotherapy, man. You're able to diagnose a patient within five minutes of meeting him or her when it takes us a week in order to be able to get an accurate a diagnosis. Wow, you, this must be your field. And I'm like, I wasn't going to tell them, oh, no, it's because I'm psychic. That's why I was doing it. But at least they validated. I was a client sat in front of me. I knew exactly what was wrong. I knew his entire past or her entire past. We got to the point. We got to it right away. Problem with that was once you become a psychotherapist, <laughs> you need a license. Mm -hmm. And when you get a license, you now have to follow guidelines. Uh -huh. You can't sit there and tell, you don't sit there and tell the client what their problem is. You have to wait until the client comes to the problem him or herself, because that's <laughs> what's going to be more meaningful, even if it takes 12 years and thousands of dollars later. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that frustrated me. So I stopped doing practice. And I actually, a friend of mine was working for hospice at the time and said, you would make an incredible hospice social worker. So I worked for hospice for six years and I helped over 500 patients during their transitioning time. And I was actually with some of them able to go with them and absolutely open up that door to do some healing work with them as they were doing it. But I learned so much working with the dying. And it was after I was working with them, I said, you know what? I'm going to become a full-time psychic because I don't want to have to be, be tied down to not be able to help these people or have to help them their way, the guideline way, you know, the, the licensing board's way, when I can see their problem. And you know what? I can tell you what your problem is, but you're still the one that has to do the work and accept it. So what difference does it make? And how much more powerful is it? If you can come to your own damn answer, you would have 10 years ago. <laughs> so why wait? So that's yeah. what I did. I'm the one of the few that has a psychotherapy degree and background and experience so I can go way down deep into the psyche that most others can't go. 
Woo! Okay, that just <laughs> that exhausted me. I don't know what it did for your listeners, man. But but um, yeah, that's where I went. That's how I was guided to go. There so I didn't mind afterwards being called a psychic. I said, the hell with it. If you can't accept a stupid word like psychic, then you have more problems than you know. I love it. So actually, I'm, I'm getting something. You could even extract that from the specifics of your story. Hell yes, lifers. Can you relate to Vincent's um, path where you, you, you know, you tried to fit into the, um, you know, the, the um, themes that you thought were acceptable for people and you tried this on, you tried that on, and none of it finally worked. And then you finally had to say, you know what? I'm a psychic for goodness sake, or I'm a whatever it is for you. So I, I uh, really appreciate you sharing that, Vincent. And, um, and then since you've g gone ahead and just declared that you're a psychic, it seems like you're having all kinds of success. I mean, you're on uh, you know, all kinds of TV shows and you've gotten all kinds of uh, notoriety. So then tell us about you know, that part of it. And then maybe we can get a little taste of of um, what, um, you know, I don't know. I will just ask you some questions around your, your site. Okay. Well, the, the interesting thing is, yes, I decided I was going to, that was it. I was going to be a full-time psychic medium. The moment I proclaimed it, and here's the most important part for the hell yes. I, I, you know, I'm not going to define your hell yes and why you created this show, but there is a reason for sure why you call it hell yes and not just yes. It's a matter, hell yes is an acknowledgement of your passion and belief, okay? That's what it means to me. A yes means, okay, you believe in something. Yes, I'm going to do that. Yes, that's a good idea. All right, so I believe in that. But a hell yes means, damn, I believe in that. And it is all about belief. So the moment you start proclaiming that you believe in yourself, you believe you deserve your dream, you believe that it's worth going after, then that's when things happen. That's yeah. when everything opened up for me. There is, here's, I'm going to throw out another principle to you. Like the law of gravity, which you can't see, other than you know it's working because right. you're not falling down or up whichever direction the earth is at the time right yeah well there's also the law of attraction yes uh -huh. and the law of attraction means whatever you put out in the universe is what you are going to get back you put out some negative garbage i guarantee you you're going to get negative garbage coming back you think you're the one that's going to walk and step in the hole down the street you are absolutely going to purposely unconsciously find a street that has a hole in it so you can trip in it to prove that you were going to do that and that's exactly we manifest and you can manifest the positive as well yeah. so what started happening the mo moment i proclaimed i am willing to do this bring it on People started mm. calling me out of the, I never advertised, not advertised at all. I just said to the universe, I said to God, I said to me, I said to my wife, all right, I'm going to be a full-time psychic medium, whatever that means, show it to me. And people started calling me for readings, but people were calling me on a daily basis to make bookings. All right, well, I've got now two, I've got three, I've got four, I got five readings today. And then that started happening day after day. They were calling me ahead of time. I was booked ahead of time. Then all of a sudden, accidentally, which by the way, there are no accidents, it's all synchronistic. Mm -hmm. um, somebody told me, why don't you start a radio show? So way back when I was, I had a blog talk radio show. It said, sure. And I started giving out all of my philosophies, everything I started research, which by the way, I did tons of research in the beginning when this did happen to me so that I could understand what was going on and normalize my, myself in my own mind. So I did unbelievable amounts of work. So I started sharing all of that information on my radio show. And one day somebody calls me to book their client on my radio show. I said, what do you mean your client? What, what, who are you? Well, we are a publicist, a PR firm. And I'm like, 
oh, a PR firm, is that what you do? Yes, we call for our clients, we represent our clients, and we call to get them on radio shows, television shows, get them seen in the media, and, uh, and get them pushed ahead and create a platform. I'm like, oh my gosh, let's talk about that. So I wound up hiring these people, Steve Allen Media, which unbelievable company, and they started getting me all of these radio shows and these television appearances, and then I started meeting other people and doing, say, why don't you do expos? I was doing expos. I was being invited to be a keynote speaker. So the, the wonderful thing about this, Einstein said this, Albert Einstein said, let me know what God is thinking, the details I don't need to know. Mm. Now, he did not believe in God as a deity being. He believed it was a power. It was a yeah. power of the universe. He also believed that it could kind of communicate with you through your inspirations. Mm. And he felt that if he had an inspiration, that was the universe or God telling him, this is what you're meant to do. So he never questioned his inspirations. And he realized that as soon as he said, okay, I'm going to work on that. All the details fell into place by themselves. Yeah. That, now, you have to be proactive. That doesn't mean, okay, I want to be um, a lawyer. And now you sit there and you wait for somebody to call you up on the phone yeah. and ask you for, to represent their first case. No, you've got to be proactive. You've got to go out into the field. You've got to go learn how to be a lawyer. Then you start believing that as long as this is what your passion is, you will receive guidance, inspiration as to where to go. You'll meet people in the craziest of places. They start bringing up a conversation and turn around and say, oh, you know, I know this law firm that's looking for somebody right now, a matter of fact. Why don't you call and tell them that I sent you? I'm a friend of, of um, the guy who's in charge. Things like that happen every single day, all day long. It's why I can teach this stuff. Yeah. You, you know, you ask me, how do you deal with a skeptic? You can't be a skeptic if the information and the work you're doing works. Then mm -hmm. it's not a skeptic anymore. Then it really is a fool who is not willing to see what is true and what the evidence is. Yeah. If people heard the type of things that I tap into, the type of help I've done, you, what would they say? Oh, that's really good guessing. You can say it was anything. It was the color of the socks that you were wearing. That's the reason why you were able to get that. We can come up with a whole bunch of dumb excuses just to condone our doubts and our fears, but that doesn't make anything else untrue. Yes. So you've, you've, everybody needs to pay attention to that so that they can be open to these things happening to them. And they do all the time. Yeah. Everybody has those experiences. How many times did you, you were thinking of your best friend and you hadn't call, spoken to him in a long time. You say, you know, something tells me I should call him. And the moment you call him, you find out he tells you he's in trouble with something and he can't believe you called, he needs your help. Or your son, your daughter, your wife, your, your, your husband, your boyfriend, girlfriend, you get this, this sensation, this feeling that is all intuition and psychic ability. Mm. And whether you want to call it that or not, that's what it is. Wait a second. I think what you're saying, I think there's a, a, I just had a little aha moment myself. You're saying that we're all psychic to a certain extent. I mean, it sounds like you have, you know, very strong, um, intuitive psychic abilities, but it's not like you're off in this corner here and, and we don't, you know, have anything like that. No, we all have that. And yes. I just, I just wanted to comment and say like, and, and hell yes, lifers out there listening to Vincent there. I don't think this is too big of a stretch for us, is it? I mean, I certainly have had many synchronistic events. I could even say that me talking to Vincent here is one of them. Uh, and I, I can certainly uh, relate to the power of manifesting and so forth. I mean, um, I, I'm, I'm right on board with you, Vincent. See, thank you. And I appreciate that. And you see, here was the difference. I help you realize some of your own experiences and then use that as part of the definition because it, it, it is true. Um, we all have that. The only difference between me, yes, was it open for me? It started that way, but then I put the time in. 
here is the time. This is how you can, and I teach this, by the way. I teach this work because there's a lot of people that want to know how to open up that channel even more so. You may not need to speak to deceased loved ones on the other side, but always that psychic ability or the intuitive ability, that is your greatest guidance going within and, and, and quieting your left brain thinking so that you can get, tap into your intuition. Carl Jung, who was a psychiatrist and he was a student of Sigmund Freud, very famous, right? Doctor said that we are all connected to a collective unconscious mind or the mind of God, he called it, but a collective unconscious be conscious because he believed that we could all come up with the same answer to similar questions. For example, you ask a person in Australia the meaning of the word mother, you're going to get the exact same definition as the Japanese fellow who has asked the same question, yeah. all right, or, on a, in another part of the world. Why? His theory was we have to be tapped in to some place that feeds us that definition, and it is the same information. Yeah. And that's where you tap into your psychic ability, where we all are connected. It's, it's why across the seas you can get a bad feeling about a loved one. Now, of course, people say, well, that's because you know them so well. Yes, the more you know a person, the more your psychic ability is open. Mm -hmm. So what I did to open it more is I worked on healing me. The mm -hmm. channel to all of this and your intuition, if we put it in a place, just so that you can think about this for a moment, Obviously, our physical body is, is not directly connected into, with, our, with our soul, the energy. It actually, the energy empowers the body, okay? But we are energy and we are life forces and souls even without the body. But we use the body in order to learn specific things with. For example, love and emotions, the majority of them are felt where? right here mm -hmm. heartfelt feelings angers and and stress and everything is felt up here mm -hmm. and that's because you create it with your thoughts all of a sudden your brain starts to blow up how come you don't feel love in your brain how come you don't feel heartache in your brain you mm -hmm. don't you actually get pressure on your heart you actually get palpitations in your heart when you're anxious and fearful, all right? It's here that you feel so much emotions. So it's in here that you have your channel. When you feel doubt, fear, anything negative, that channel closes. So skeptics that are always wanting to be proven something, their door is closed. Why don't I get information? Why don't, well, because your door is closed. Mm -hmm. you, don't, you doubt it to start with, so you're closing the door. It's, yeah. it's like saying, um, well, I believe that there's somebody at the front door, but I'm, I'm keeping the door closed, and so you never find out who it is. Mm -hmm. You never get to experience where you right or wrong. Open the darn door. You'll mm -hmm. find out if somebody's there and let you have a peephole. Mm -hmm. So I worked on healing myself and working on my torments from the past because they linger with everybody. Okay, which is what gets in the way. That's the work that I do is to stop stopping yourself to heal that. All of that opens up and your psychicness and your intuition winds up increasing. That's all I did. So it's not because I'm chosen. It's not because I'm a special one. I can teach you to even have more power than me. And, and that's where it all comes from is by healing yourself, being aware, believing, being willing to honor your inner voice because that's where you hear things and, and you see things in your inner mind. Honoring that and is, is what makes it stronger and stronger and stronger. So there. Yes, I love everybody's it. I love psychic. It. You know, so I, who knows who's out there that might be, you know, um, inspired to even reach out to you, Vincent, and maybe they have some intuitive Paul. abilities that they want to cultivate. I, I would be remiss to leave this conversation without, I don't even know what you typically do with people that you're talking to, but, uh, and I'm not asking you to give me a reading per se, but is there something you can kind of, I don't know, I don't even know what to ask exactly, but you, know, you want to 
do something with me? Or okay. Yeah, I'll do something. You don't have to ask just as long as you're open for it, if that's sure. okay. Am I allowed to tap into your soul and, and go there with you then? Let's do it. All right, let's do it. Okay, so here is the thing. This podcast is only part of who you are and only a partial way to get words out there. There's actually even more way for you to be getting your work done. And I find it very interesting because several of my hosts have an inspiration to write a book. Mm -hmm. And you are meant to do that. Yeah. I believe you've already had inclinations, inspirations, and that there were words written down already yeah. somewhere, be it in journal form, be it in, in short note form, or be it in actual starting to write something. Mm -hmm. form, there is definitely a book coming in 2020. It, yes. you, you need to tap into it. So I will ask you this, does that resonate with you as to what a plan is already? Absolutely. It's one of my goes for 2020 and it uh, is already in, in the works. So yes. Now to, for your listeners, did you give me any clues to that before the show at all? Absolutely not. We haven't. We Absolutely like not. One minute or two minutes before we actually went live. Okay. And is there anywhere online that I could research that information that says that the host of Hell Yes is planning on writing a book in 2020? You would have to dig pretty deep. I, I announced that that was an idea on Facebook of mine a year ago, but, uh, but yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect. All right. You Thank you for your honesty. Yeah. I can assure you that I never, never looked up. I don't have the time to look up all my hosts, quite honestly. All I know is the little blurb of instructions that I get on my calendar yes. when I'm supposed to call in and what questions I might be asked. So, I did not know that of you, but it's sticking out like a sore thumb in your soul, and I can absolutely experience that. Now, also, do you celebrate Christmas? Would there be a reason for you getting a Christmas present or a present coming up because either the holiday or some other celebration at this time? Yes, I do celebrate Christmas. Okay. Yeah. You are absolutely going to be receiving a very unexpected. There are some things you already either know you're going to get, but definitely there's one gift you are not expecting at all, which is very special and very inspiring and motivating. Okay. All right. All right. And yeah. you need to be taking a trip to help you with your book. Travel is very important to you. Mm, oh, that's absolutely true. You've nailed it. Okay. Yeah. And so you'll be going places and just... Like I said, understand you can take your podcast with you, which is the great thing about podcasts. Uh -huh. um, however, this is just a springboard. It is a practice for you. And you, like me, like being heard. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, absolutely. there's only one reason for that. It's because you've got some good things to say. Yeah. So you need to follow up on that and continue with that. Um, and just on a cautious side, pay attention to health and unnecessary injuries, mm -hmm. um, particularly in um, either exercising or physical activity. I don't know if you're climbing something, um, uh, whether it be maybe outdoors type of an activity, but I'm seeing possible, it's, I'm only telling you, yeah. Because if you have it in your mind, you can avoid it, okay? It's not going to make it occur. But I see a fall and a necessary minor surgery if you do injure yourself. And I'm kind of feeling you've injured yourself before already. I'm not sure when right now. I'm, it, that would take a little bit too much time. But, but a future injury coming up again into 2020 with physical activity. Okay. Okay. I'll, I'll keep on the, on the lookout and keep that in mind as I, Is there uh, something that you normally do that you like to do physically? Well, you know, I like, um, I like going for a jog. I like, uh, I've, I've got a Nepal trip. I mean, that's not going to happen in 2020, but I, and, and yet I have been experiencing some, you know, physical, I want to say limitations, but like some, you know, pains in my leg that feel like they're like, Oh, I don't know if I can actually do these things. So 
yeah. I, I would pay attention to the jogging thing and uh -huh. maybe change that to maybe some walking or yeah. treadmillish type of thing or some other activity thing some because that's, that's because the something is going on there and it's in your possible jogging with a falling balance issue and then injuring yourself a knee an ankle a leg um, which would cause it so that's a, a caution listen to your body and see if changing the activity helps it Okay, great, great. Yeah, I've, I've already been thinking about that, so that's great. Well, there you go. Great. That's how it works, just minorly, okay? Yeah. But usually, if we have the time and privacy, yeah. um, because I'm sure there are, you do not want me to go some places, you don't want me to go where I have seen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> now, <laughs> wink, 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 wink. Right. Yeah. No, with all of us, right? That's yeah. uh, we. But I go to the depths, the, the the deepest part of the psyche, because the goal is to help unblock you, mm -hmm. to help you to be able to believe in yourself, to help get rid of all maladaptive beliefs about yourself, and and disempower the defense mechanisms that keep you from seeing what's getting in the way. And in order to do that, we have to go deep. We have to go far back. A lot of, that's what my mediumship helps me with. I tap into spirits that do come along and help in the process of this that give me messages that validate for the client. Yes, this is true. You know, people want to know why do psychics need to tap into your past or tell you things you already know? Well, duh. If, if, what, <laughs> why would you listen to anything the psychic has to say unless he or she can prove to you that they're connecting to you? And the way we show you we're connecting is like I just said. So for example, I said to you, you have had the inspiration to write a book. Why do I need to tell you that if you already know you've had the inspiration to write the book? Because now that you know I knew that, then the next thing I say about you've got to get it done in 2020 because it's important has more meaning. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that is the reason why we do that. It's not a gimmick. It's not, you know, and sometimes a lot of times we get it wrong. I get a lot of no's. That again doesn't mean I'm wrong. When was the last time a carpenter built a house absolutely from the blueprint, never made any mistakes and came up with the perfect house? Mm -hmm. I think you've, that's the reason why you have walkthroughs. You got a 90 day walkthrough. You got a year walkthrough because things go wrong. And the Things go wrong with doctors. Things go wrong with lawyers, accountants. So please give a psychic a break. It doesn't <laughs> mean that they are discredit. Now, there are charlatans, absolutely, but there are charlatans in every single field, not sure. just my field. Yeah. So give, give a break and give it a chance. You never know what you're going to get. Yeah, give a psychic a break. Give give uh, a psychic a chance. And I don't know. I feel like I've opened up even over the course of this hour. I was not a doubter, a hundred percent doubter to begin with. But um, I, I really like the way that you've uh, kind of uh, you know given this message to me and my listeners, Vincent. And um, we need to start winding down. But uh, before we do, I always like to make sure and let you let our listeners know where they where they can. Um, get in touch with you for more information if they are interested. Well, I'm on all the social media. So if you yep. go to first my website at vincentjenna.com, okay. and that's with a G-E-N-N-A, that's the first place that you can really link with me, see what my events are. They may be in your area. Um, it also is where you would book a reading with me. I have a calendar in there and a program that you can go to. I also have an online store where I have some very profound lectures and a guided meditation series that you can listen to and then purchase the digital audios for. They're very powerful. And then from there, you can go to Facebook. My Facebook page is Vincent Jenna MSW. I have live events where you can participate in. Yeah. And wherever you're going to write me, if you write me on Facebook, if you write me on my website, Instagram, if you tweet me, I will always respond back to you. That is me that is responding back, not my gatekeeper. 
um, though I have one that helps me along the way, but I'm the one that responds back. And then, of course, you can listen to my, I host an online radio show for Unity. Unity is a, is a spiritual thought um, center, just like Science of Mind, there's Unity. It's a new thought movement center um, where we teach very positive, powerful things about you and your relationship with a deity, with yourself, with the universe, whatever. Um, and so that's at noon on Wednesdays, Eastern time. That's noon Eastern time. And you can also call in during that time with any question that you have. And I have the podcast for that. So if you go again, my website will take you to it or go to unityonlineradio.org and you can see all the podcasts. There's wonderful other luminaries on there where you can get really insightful information, you know, it's either going to fill you, open your door, or just constantly just reinforce the fact that you think everything is bullshit. So, <laughs> but that, but that's going to be up to you. Exactly. Go that's what door number one. is for. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So that's how you can get in touch with me. Thank you for asking. You bet, Vincent. Well, um, Vincent, th thanks once again for for coming on the show. It's been an absolute uh, pleasure having you oh. uh, on the show and and hearing your story. And um, I always like to wrap things up by saying "Hell yes" together on the count of three. It's sort of a we used to do a long "Hell yes." Now it's more of like a "Hell yes" sort of a thing. Yeah. Or, or okay. Think? Yeah. You ready? Yeah. So I'm ready. Three, we're, we're gonna do it. Ready? One, two, three. Hell, Hell yes. yes. All right. Well, Vincent, thanks so much for joining me. Oh, I, it was my honor. Thank you so much for inviting me. I really enjoyed it. You got you are absolutely phenomenal in your own insight. So keep it going, man, because you're going places out there. Oh yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Vincent. Hell yes. Hell yes. Let's do this. 2020. Absolutely. I'll be working with you sometime again and not just here. Oh, great. Oh, well, the, I mean, I guess he's it's Vincent's the one to know. So all right. Talk to you soon. Take care.